Well, welcome everybody. It's six o'clock. I come from a theater family. I try to begin on time. Uh, this is our Writing Forward re Reading Series event. Um, I'll make a few announcements and then turn it over to our wonderful poets for the evening. Uh, we have five uh, Native American California poets reading tonight. And this event is sponsored by the Santa Clara Review, the Creative Writing Program of the English Department, and co-sponsored with the help of the Office for Multicultural Learning. Uh, I also want to thank the University Library for uh, allowing us to use this beautiful room for, for the reading, the St. Clair Room. Uh, we are also streaming on YouTube Live, and it appears to be working. Uh, there is a chat function if people want to ask questions later on. We'll see if we can get to those. And if you feel like letting me know that it's working, anyone out there in YouTube land, that would be nice. Um, my name is Kirk Glazer. I'm the um, Director of Creative Writing and the Faculty Advisor for the Santa Clara Review. Is the volume okay? Yeah? Okay, great. Um, I have the honor of welcoming Lucille Lang Day, Allison Hart, Dave Holt, Linda Noel, and Stephen Meadows to Santa Clara University. Uh, Lucille Lang Day co edited two recent wonderful anthologies in which the work of all these poets appear uh, Red Indian Road West, Native American Poetry from California, and Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California. Uh, these collections feature many other outstanding poets and are for sale after the reading in the back at the table in the back when you can also have poets sign copies. There are also copies of the Santa Clara Review. Feel free to take a, a copy or two to share as well on the, the side table back there. Um, before we begin, uh, we wish to take a moment to acknowledge that Santa Clara University sits on the land of the Ohlone and the Mwekma Ohlone people. We remember their connection to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, learn, meditate, and pray on their traditional homeland. Let us take a moment of silence to pay respect to their elders and to all Ohlone people past and present. While a land acknowledgement is important, it is not enough. And it so happens that tomorrow night, uh, November 17th, the Office for Multicultural Learning is hosting a difficult dialogue entitled Beyond Land Acknowledgements to explore next steps to be taken. Um, I don't know how well this can be seen in YouTube land, but um, I'll just say the details, and there's a flyer in the back for anyone here who wants to take a picture or check it out. It's at 5.30. It's a Zoom meeting. The ID is 937-3911-1928, and the password is 924427. Uh, working toward this end, one option is to make a donation or Shuumi land tax to the Sogoreate Land Trust, which is an urban indigenous women-led land trust based in the San Francisco Bay Area that facilitates the return of indigenous land to indigenous people. Um, I really don't think this flyer is going to work very well, but there's some, it's, it's uh, so S-O-G-O-R-E-A-T-E landtrust.com, also a flyer in the back there if you want to take a photo of that before you leave. Uh, check out their website, consider a donation for tonight's event. Uh, they're doing really amazing work. Um, taking this a step further, uh, it's time that Santa Clara University instituted a reparations program for descendants of the Muwekma Ohlone to make amends for the injustices carried out by the Catholic Church, just as universities such as Georgetown, a fellow Jesuit institution, are finally making reparations to descendants of African Americans sold into slavery by the university. Such actions are never going to completely take care of the damages done, but they are essential steps toward justice. Now, let us hear the amazing voices for whom we've gathered this evening. Lucille will introduce the other poets, but before I turn it over, I wanna say a few words about her accomplishments. 
Lucille Langde of Wampanoag ancestry was born and raised in Oakland and nearby Piedmont. Her memoir, Married at 14, A True Story, received a Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Literary Award and was a finalist for the Northern California Book Award. Her first poetry collection, Self-Portrait with Hand Microscope, a title I love, won the Joseph Henry Jackson Award in Literature. Her books include 11 poetry collections and chapbooks, two children's books, three books on science education, and many awards for her writing. Lucille's poetry often draws upon the natural world as well as scientific awareness and language to reveal the ways that family, culture, and political and historical forces shape our world. In her poetry, beings of the natural world are not metaphor or not merely, but are part of herself, her family, and her culture. Birds and trees, mountains and lakes provide an awareness of interbeing, a source of sustenance and insight for healing and understanding on a personal level, as well as for interrogating social and political forces that shape her world. For example, a poem entitled Return to Akushnet, after a chronicle of family history and loss, ends with a dream visitation of her deceased grandpa Eb, where the natural world links them through time and against historical forces of destruction. Go back to California, he said. I'll come visit you. I think he wanted to stand beside me, watching a western gull, its pink feet skimming the crests of the Pacific, hear Hutton's vireo call from the top of a California oak, wrap his taut arms tight around us both like a shipwrecked sailor clinging to the mast, but I knew in the end he'd let go. Let us join this poet here on the California coast. Please welcome Lucille Langday. Thank you very much, Kirk. And I'll start by saying Wuni Nakan, Kuda Pudish, um, in the Wampanoag language. Um, that's good evening. Thank you very much for being here. And I want to thank all of the people who are here live, as well as all of the people uh, who are watching on YouTube. Um, and I will just add to um, of Kirk's wonderful words uh, ac acknowledging the Ohlone's that um, the Ohlone's are still very much alive and, and with us today. They're not people of the past. The Muwekma Ohlone's whose traditional land included most of Santa Clara County are currently seeking federal recognition. Um, and one of the poets reading tonight, Stephen Meadows is of Rumson Ohlone descent, and so we're, we're very happy to have him here with us. So uh, we're going to be reading from these two anthologies that I co-edited, as well as from, from other works. Um, this one, uh, Red Indian Road West, uh, Native American Poetry from California, includes work by all of the poets reading tonight. Um, I co-edited this book with Lakota poet Kirch, Kirk Schweigman, and how this anthology came about was that Kirk and I read together in 2014. And after we had this reading, I had a dream that we were reading together um, from a, an anthology of Native American poetry from California. And in my dream, uh, the, the anthology was called The Road to California. And when I told Kirk about this dream, Kurt about this dream, he said, wow, we should create this anthology, um, but we have to get a better title. And so we came up together, we came up with the, the title Red Indian Road West, Native American Poetry from California. And it's the first, uh, and so far the only anthology that includes um, work by all of the different Native American groups in California. There were previous anthologies. We researched this before doing our anthology. There were previous anthologies that just included work by poets from California tribes. But California actually has the largest Native American population of any state with over 750,000 people who recognize, who identify as Native American. Um, and uh, um, some of these people uh, are from tribes that are indigenous to California, there, and there are one, over 100 currently federally recognized um, tribes in California. And, but then a lot of them, too, were people who 
uh, or whose families before them relocated to California. So in addition to having the largest Native American population of, uh, of any state, it's possibly also the most diverse. So that's one book we'll be reading from. Um, we'll also, uh, most of the poets reading tonight also have poems in this book, Fire and Rain, that I co-edited, Eco Poetry of California. Um, and that, that way, this one came about that started um, in 2011, way back when I read a couple of other anthologies of eco poetry. And I loved the, those anthologies. They were really, really good. But I felt like, hey, something's missing. California is such a big, beautiful, ecologically diverse state that we need our own eco poetry anthology. And so for the next few years, I worked on it off and on by myself, but I couldn't bring it to fruition until I brought desert poet Ruth Nolan on as a co-editor. So I was very fortunate to have Ruth work with me on Fire and Rain and very fortunate also to have Kurt Schweigman work with me um, on Red Indian Road West. Uh, so uh, uh, Fire and Rain is divided into eight sections corresponding to major bioregions of California. Um, there are sections, for example, for coast and ocean, for the desert, um, for the uh, Sierra Nevada and Cascades, for the coastal redwoods and, and so forth. And Ruth and I decided to call this book Fire and Rain, uh, not because we love the James Taylor song, would which we do, um, but because fire and rain are so important in shaping all of California ecosystems. Fire and rain really determine what is going to grow, where, uh, what can thrive, and what is going to die. So, um, so that is how we came up with the title, Fire and Rain. So I'm going to start out by reading one of my own poems from Red Indian Road West. Uh, this is called At Lake Tahoe. Granite mountains, dense with white firs, lodgepole pines, and ponderosas, rise abruptly from the lake's blue bowl, so deep its waters could cover all of California and Nevada. The Washoes, who lived here 10,000 summers, named it lake in the sky because it reflected clouds, sunset, and stars. They caught Lahant and trout in the lake, mountain whitefish in icy streams. On the other side of the continent, my Wampanoag ancestors were gathering cranberries, covering their summer homes with cattail mats, baking clams, drying corn, and fishing for salmon off Cape Cod. The Washoes used only fallen trees for homes they would dismantle before leaving Lake in the Sky each winter. In fall, they gathered pinion pine nuts to eat until spring. This was before white people came and cut down the pinion pines to build their houses, dynamited the mountains in search of silver and gold and claim the fish. Now, a paddle boat with three decks takes tourists on cruises of Lake Tahoe. Yet in summer, washos still do the pine nut dance, and Wampanoags do the grass dance to keep the world in balance and remind us that the earth is living. Every rock is sacred, and every tree and salmon has a soul. And next, um, I'm going to read, I'm, I'm just going to read two more poems and a short prose piece. Um, and next I'm going to read a short prose piece from Fire and Rain. And it's by Pomo poet and writer E.K. Cooper, um, who uh, sadly passed away last year. Um, and this is uh, E.K. Cooper's piece, Where Have They Gone? Echoed memories of they are like a family. You must leave the generations whole and take only a few and move down the cliff. Wisdom passed from my dad to me when I was a child. 
The ocean cliffs of Fort Bragg, California, blanketed with mussels, the oldest ones, each the size of a brick nestled among the younger generations, providing shelter and comfort. Once gathered, they were dumped in a large steaming pot covered until the mussels opened. Each was eaten whole, straight from the shell, an orange delicious meal. Ocean rocks covered in dark and light green seaweed. Each plant was four to six feet long, swaying with each breaking wave. I would grab a handful from the rock and pull before the next wave came in. Seaweed would wrap itself around my arm while others escaped my grasp. It felt slimy, smelled salty, but when dried, fried, and wrapped in a warm tortilla, it was delicious. These same rocks held hidden treasures as well, a blind hand reaching and feeling for a rock that is not. A piece of flat metal was used to pry under and work back and forth, then would pop off an abalone the size of a dinner plate. It would be pounded, cut into strips, floured and fried. A food so rich in flavor, only a small portion was needed to satisfy your craving. Pinoleville, my dad's reservation, has a creek that holds the best of all of them, the salmon run. The river water would be bank to bank as the salmon swam upstream to their spawning grounds. Native men would wait with spears and hooks and wade into the creek to catch salmon for their families, always with the knowledge to take a small amount and leave enough for future salmon runs. Baked, smoked, or fried, the flavor always reminded you that river water held a flavor all its own. The Fort Bragg ocean cliffs and rocks still remain, but are now barren. The Pinoleville Reservation Creek is now a trickle on a good day, but most often dry. I learned in my youth traditional ways of being one with the plants, animals, and Mother Earth. I yearned to pass down my knowledge the way I was taught by showing. My youth of plenty now sits with its spirit heavy with sorrow as my adulthood wrestles with a future of none. This Pomo asks one question, where have they gone? And um, next, I'm just going to read two more pieces. Uh, next, I'm going to read a, a poem of mine that uh, hasn't been published yet, but it describes a dilemma faced by, I think, probably by most parents and grandparents today. Uh, it's called 24 Hours with Grandchildren, ages 4, 8, 9, and 11. Yes, you can use the iPod and Kindle to play games while we drive to my house. Yes, you can play with the iPod and Kindle until your cousins get here. No, it's time for dinner. The iPod and Kindle are not allowed at the table. Wouldn't you rather play with your cousins after dinner than use the iPod and Kindle? Yes, I know they have an iPod too and can also play with my iPhone. It's bedtime. Let's read instead of using the iPods and iPhone and Kindle. Yes, you can use the iPods and iPhone and Kindle before breakfast. No, you can't bring the iPods and iPhone and Kindle to the table. We're going to make gingerbread houses now. The devices stay out of the kitchen. It's time for lunch. No, the iPods and iPhone and Kindle still can't come in the kitchen. We're going to a powwow now. We have to do something besides the iPods and iPhone and Kindle. No, you can't use the iPods and iPhone and Kindle in the car. Just talk to each other. 
I'm sorry you walked into a pole. I think you'll be okay. Just watch where you're going. <laughs> yes, we can get presents at the powwow. Let's also watch some of the dances. You need to be careful when you're running around. You could fall and get hurt. I'm sorry you fell and hurt your knee. I think it will be okay. It isn't bleeding. I'm sorry you fell and hurt your hand. You should wash it with soap. It's bleeding. I'm sorry you smashed your leg in the car door. It will be okay. I don't think it's broken. Yes, to take your mind off the pain, you can play with the iPods and iPhone and Kindle. So they're a, a little older now and thankfully getting interested in other things. And I'm going to conclude um, with a, a poem from my latest book, uh, Birds of San Pancho and Other Poems of Place, which came out from Blue Light Press last year. And this is called Names of the States. Alabama, for the Alabama tribe, forced from Alabama to Texas when white people claimed their land in 1805. Alaska, for the Aleut word Alyeska, meaning mainland, the place toward which the sea flows. Arizona, the word for small spring in the Oadam language of a Southwest desert people who couldn't vote until 1948. Arkansas, another name for the Quapaws, the downstream people who were removed to Oklahoma from their ancestral lands. Connecticut, from the Algonquian word for long river place. Delaware, from Baron de la War, Virginia's first governor, whose name rechristened the local Lenny Lenape, the first tribe to sign a treaty with the US. Hawaii, for Hawaii Loa, discoverer of the islands in Polynesian myth. Idaho, maybe Shoshone for the sun comes down the mountain, or the Apache name for the Comanches who drove them from the Southern Plains. Illinois, a French transliteration of Alinwi, the Ojibwe word for the Anoka, whose 13 tribes were reduced to five by European disease. Indiana, land of the Indians, the Delaware, Piankashaw, Kickapoo, Wea, Shawnee, Miami, and Potawatomi, who were mostly removed by 1846. Iowa, from the Dakota name for the Iowa tribe, meaning sleepy ones. Kansas, the Dakota word for the South Wind people, whose last fluent speaker of the Kansa language died in 1983. Kentucky, derived from the Iroquoian word for on the meadow. Massachusetts, people of the great hills, that is, the Blue Hills south of Boston Harbor, who were decimated by smallpox in 1633. Michigan, from Michigamaa, great water in the language of the Ojibwe, who like so many others, didn't understand the treaties ceding their land. Minnesota, from Minnesota, the name the Dakotas gave the Minnesota River, whose clear blue water reflected clouds. Mississippi, from Mississippi, Ojibwe for the Great River, along which more than 20 tribes lived and fished. Missouri, for the Missouri tribe that lived on the Missouri River, a Siouan people whose name means town of the big canoes. Nebraska, from Nebraska, the Omaha word for broad water, a description of the Platte River by which the tribe lived. New Mexico, named for the Mexicas, a Nahuatl speaking people who ruled the Aztec empire until the Spanish conquered them in 1519. North and South Dakota, named for a Sioux tribe 
whose men were sentenced in 1862 to the largest mass execution in U.S. history, though Dakota means friend. Ohio, from Ohio, continuously giving river in the language of the Senecas, whose land was flooded in 1965 following construction of Kanzua Dam. Oklahoma, from Oklahoma, Choctaw for red people, a name proposed by the chief of the Choctaw Nation during treaty negotiations in 1866. Oregon, maybe from Waragon, an Algonquian word for beautiful river, but so many native words and languages have been lost that it's hard to say. Tennessee, for the Cherokee town Tanasi, a village on the Little Tennessee River, until the Cherokees were marched to Oklahoma along the Trail of Tears. Texas, meaning friends or allies in the language of the Caddo's who were removed to Oklahoma in 1859. Utah, from Utahai, an Apache word meaning people of the mountains. Wisconsin, from Wisconsin, the name for the Wisconsin River in the Miami language, river running through a red place. Wyoming, a contraction of Mechi Weaming, a Delaware word first used for a valley in Pennsylvania, meaning at the big plains. And yes, every part of this land is Indian country, from forest to desert, mountain to prairie, Manhattan to Yosemite, Tallahassee to Seattle, all the fields, rivers, hills, and canyons between the two shining seas. So. Thank you. Um, the next poet reading will be Stephen Meadows. Steve is a Californian of pioneer and Ohlone descent. He has earned degrees from UC Santa Cruz and San Francisco State University. His poems have appeared in anthologies and journals nationwide, and one of them graces a plaque in San Francisco. He has devoted much of his life to poetry in an attempt to honor his ancestors and the beauty of the natural world. He is a veteran of public radio, where he has interviewed scores of musicians and visionaries from the British Isles to North America. He has done all kinds of work to keep the poems coming. His poetry collection, Releasing the Days, was published by Heyday, and his new collection, Winter Work, will be out soon. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Lucy. I appreciate it. And uh, I would also, uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank uh, my wonderful wife, Carly, who's at the book table back there for uh, all of her support over the years, in making my work possible. And I would like to thank Santa Clara University for hosting this reading. Uh, the first poem is called Waterhole. A reedy place full of grasses and tulies, fronded, toad colored by the bay's curved edge. Ancestors, accustomed to the moist pliant ground, came down the long swale for their water a day at a time, stepping soft in the wet mud, knowing they would slip just a little. Quietly out of the way. Uh, this is one that uh, I wrote for Richard Brodigan. <coughs> At first light remorse, an ache in the room, the urge to weep and with reason enough, and yet the knowledge that by day's end, enough wine 
all will be well again. Those ones on the corner by the park, those ones in the weeds, as Brodigan said once, drinking quietly out of the way. The world too much, too vacant, and nothing for the pain. This one is called Drought. Hot breath on lupin, on sizzling sierra. Parched grass, the seed pods tick soft in slow wind. On the skittle this summer, madrones are bright yellow. Ponderosa, brown needles, low water sucks the stone. And I'm going to uh, finish with a longer poem called In the Water Over Stones from my great aunt Isabel Meadows. Your voice, Isabel, is a quail's voice as the sun's song ticks in the brush. It is the hawk's voice and the heart's heat of the rabbit in the parched summer grass. Nearby in the river, in the water over stones, it is a willow voice. It is a crayfish voice in the hollows, in the darkening places. At first light, it is the wind's voice, the mouth of the river, Chuli voice, the voice of a hundred breezes. The sun marks out the red madrone, and in the canyons, it is a redwood voice, a sycamore voice sweet-scented. In the spring, it is the lupin voice, a blue, white, and purple coverlet voice all over the hills and the meadows. On the river banks, as the set fires burn and the steelhead run, it is the hunter's voice, flinging the gleamers silver on the sand. Though the houses of rich men now cover these hills, it is your spirit voice, your evening voice, your voice of the western waters. The stars hang out over the point of wolves on the edge of the world, the sea lions call, the otters break open abalone. It is the voice of bright shells. It is the voice of the valley and the mountain, Isabel. It is the voice of the people too. It is the weaver's voice. It is the young girl's voice, the gatherers and the singers and the farmer's voice, the wives and the children's and the old woman's voice. It is the Indian voice and the whalerman's voice and the voice of the servant escaping. It is the voice of your face across the years, Isabel, in my grandfather's face, in my father's face and in my face as well. It is the voice of the ones on the edges, Isabel. It is the voice of those ones with no voices. Hawk and rabbit, quail and brush, water and willow and crayfish and stone, wind in the canyons, daylight through limbs, the lupin, the steelhead, the cook fire's call, beans and tortillas, your memories, Isabel, talking, talking to us all. Thank you all very much. Hey, uh, thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was great. Um, that beautiful poem he read for Isabel Meadows is in Red Indian Road West. And I'll say a little more about her, his great aunt, his grandfather's sister, um, was the last fluent speaker of the Brumson Ohlone language. Uh, she was also fluent in English. She was a linguist and she spent the last five years of her life at the Smithsonian uh, recording the, the Ohlone language and oral history and stories. Um, and it was her work doing that that has made uh, an Ohlone language recovery program pos possible today.
So um, our next reader uh, is a, another poet from one of the native nations of California, Linda Noel. Uh, Linda is of Koyun Kawi descent and grew up in Mendocino County. Um, the Koyun Kawis are also called Concows, which was a name given to them by uh, white settlers who couldn't be troubled with trying to pronounce Koyun Kawi. And it means uh, people of the meadows. Uh, she currently resides in Ukiah, California, where she is poet laureate emerita. She is the author of a chat book where you first saw the eyes of Coyote and has been nominated for a pushcart prize. One of her poems is included in the permanent collection uh, at the Museum of the West, and another was adapted and put to music by the Pasadena Choir. Her work has been included in many anthologies, such as When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, Tending the Fire, and The Dirt is Red Here. So welcome, Linda. Sorry, I forgot my, great to be here. Um, I did bring a copy of the book um, edited by Joey Harjo, um, and I will start out with that poem. You know, you never know what's gonna happen with poems. This poem has, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of this poem. Um, and also I wanted to note that in the anthology, somehow they aged me 10 years. Um, I put my uh, birth date wrong and my sisters who were elder were like, man, you're older than us. Um, <laughs> Anyway, lesson in fire. My father built a good fire. He taught me to tend the fire, how to make it stand so it could breathe and how the flames create coals that turn into faces or eyes of fish swimming out of flames into gray rivers of ash and how the eyes and the faces look out at us, burn up for us to heat the air that we breathe. And so into us, we swallow all the shapes created in a well-tended fire. Um, my father used to always say, always have fire on you. Um, and a neighbor, young neighbor kid goes, why? And he goes, because he can keep you alive. Um, which is true. I was asked to um, write a little piece about um, Native, Amer Native American Heritage Month, which is November. And this is what I wrote. Native American Heritage Month is an interesting concept in recognizing Native peoples and paying homage to a people who hold a unique place in America. It seems almost fitting that the month be November and that Thanksgiving is one of the oldest and celebrated traditions along with one of the most significant benchmarks in American history. The designation of November as Native Heritage Month is for me an act of defiance of the actual brutal acts that are the foundation of the Thanksgiving celebration. I have been asked many times in my life by all types of individuals, what Thanksgiving meant to my family and I, and did we celebrate? Any response could be simple or complex, shallow or deep. That inquiry for me is part of Native American Heritage Month. Each year, school children like I and my siblings did learn and relearn about pilgrims, harvest, and even make paper feathered headbands while dismissing the magnitude of which Native people were experiencing destruction and dislocation that would continue throughout the history of America. So, acknowledging Heritage Month like Thanksgiving has been to my family an act of defiance. Yes, mainstream America celebrates pilgrims, pumpkins, and cranberries. We celebrate survival. Survival under the most concentrated efforts to exterminate us. Yes, that is the word used in historical documents in dealing with the native population. Yes, we have turkey. Yes, we have ham and mashed potatoes and many pies. We gather because the holiday allows us to do so, offering days off work and time to travel and gather. In the old way, my great grandmother held a spring and fall gathering. This is tradition. 
to acknowledge the changing of the seasons, welcome and prepare the coming of the months. My family viewed Thanksgiving as that gathering, as is also the old way. To be native is to give and offer thanks routinely. Thankful for what you have, even if it be very little, whether it is acorn harvest, firewood for warmth, healthy families, and this to be practiced daily, followed by seasonal tributes. To pray is to give thanks. Thankful for this creation, thankful for this life. For to take life for granted is an act that cannot go without negative consequence. Native American Heritage Month is significant in that the contribution of Native peoples is acknowledged and celebrated along with recognizing the historical truths of the cost we have paid at the expense of America's growth. We have survived. We remain, and although Native American Heritage Month offers an opportunity for all to celebrate Natives, we are worthy of acknowledgement, recognition, and celebration every dawn. Shall we know each other as we are, human beings, each day, every day, with each heartbeat, held in motion with moon pull of sun, blood and breath, granted each with simple, indecipherable vitality, with Earth's molten center. Of us all, all of us, humanity, celebrated, acknowledged daily, each season, a song of thanks for sunrise, for survival, every man, each woman, human being. Change the subject a little bit. <laughs> Untitled. The TV says not to worry about salmon and steelhead because there's a government program for them too. And this guy probably believes fish can walk up a ladder of cement and steel, but he's angry over nonsense spending and government overkill. So I know he knows nothing of salmon and their sacredness, something not for sale. Rain belief. Swollen sky, sing us some rain. Sway oak arms, shed your blue clothing. Let free your moist brown flesh flung against bone windows. Flaunt your sleek body, fly above thirsty dreams. Fall into my parched canyon throat. Fill my river up. Fool me into thinking wetness is enough. Watch me flood myself. Feed the memory, melt mountains, make mud. And that's because we need rain. Salmon flesh beneath moon, a feast is near. That fish in night sky, going up river, heading home this acorn time, names his journey, calls him back to beginnings, called back to a soft circle belly, flaming red fire, flesh feeding an October night flight, a fish across a frozen sky with skin of stars. I have seen that same star-colored salmon flickering in another river, not named Sky, but not far from here. Several nights back, I stopped at that river and moon gave streaks cut by fish splitting a silver ribbon of water, which was on that particular night, a lean woman body swaying and dancing the river motion beneath moon. I'm going to read from the anthology. I had several pieces in here. It's also interesting. I go through this thing. It's like, okay, this is done. Then I'll read again. And I'll go, oh, wait, it needs to be changed. Then I change it. No, I should have left it. Um, but um, I had seen um, Toni Morrison in San Francisco in conversation. And she was saying how she... Um, We'll read something from 40 years ago, and while she's reading it, she'll go, oh, I should have put a comma there. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know. Um, I'm going to read this one, and then I'll finish with 
with one more. Um, we're close to winter. Winter within. Winter glimmers before me, lonely, shoulder down, hip angled. I am part of my grandpa who waited for first snowfall before leaving Willow Creek. Part of my mother who helped push her father's car from snow covered red dirt ditches. Part of my grandma living snowbound in pine country. Part of my father who walked the miles to town sledding food back to grandma's cabin. Winter draws its shawl about us. Salmon's fall run has faded. Acorns have dropped and mushrooms have found light. I look into winter and know that no frost can freeze the spirit. No thousand winters of ice could extinguish the flaming heart of my people. Um, I said I was going to do um, one more, but I, I feel like I, I should read out of this um, anthology, which is a real accomplishment. Um, I remember I had a piece in an anthology that Joy Harjo uh, edited, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. And um, afterward, there was conversation and somebody said, would you do this again? And she said, no. But she obviously did. <laughs> um, I, I, I am actually, um, I, I read the poem that is in that book, so I'm just going to finish with um, a poem about the moon, and I don't know if any of you noticed where the moon was tonight. Um, Actually, I'll finish with a poem about Northern women because I'm from the North. Okay. <laughs> northern women. The Northern winter woman is the wet and moody one. Her legs embrace naked hard timber. She is the woman who pushes fog inland. Moist brown woman, bent willow woman, the wood chopping woman. The wet winter woman struggles against wind bending her back. She is the white water woman who lingers with every storm. Snow-faced woman, waiting salmon woman, the fire building woman. She is the earth sucking water back into her womb. The woman who has herself become night, whose pulse is the stirring motion of flowing water where wet women awaken in black forests. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you, Linda. Terrific, I really loved hearing your poetry and also your thoughts about Native American Heritage Month and Thanksgiving. And I agree that we all should be thankful every day for survival. And let's see, Allison Hart was not the next reader. The next reader is Dave Holt. <laughs> uh, Dave was born in Toronto of Irish, English, and Ojibwe ancestry. And he moved to California as an aspiring songwriter. Also a musician and composer, he and his wife, Chapel collaborate on composing, recording, and mixed poetry song performances. His poetry has won several prizes, including a Literary Cultural Arts Award for his book, Voyages to Ancestral Islands, which tells the story of reuniting with his Anishinaabe Ojibwe ancestors. His work is included in several anthologies, such as Red Indian Road West and Descanso's Words from the Wayside, where his poem received a Pushcart Prize nomination. Welcome, Dave. I got a nickname when I was living in Toronto. They called me Toronto Tonto. <laughs> Tonto is actually one of the most 
contributing Indians to the culture. Um, Jay Silverheels is one of his names. And he started a school for actors in Hollywood after his success as Tonto. <clears throat> Panorama. Good morning cows innocently graze, new green grass atop Kirker Pass, hilltops where we travel closer to clouds and dreams, joy remembered as we drag wounded bodies, broken hearts through a panorama of beauty that hides the brokenness. Nature too with her wounds, though domestic cows innocently graze protected in gullies of springtime green. Butterfly sanctuaries are invaded by armored Humvees. Desert creatures endangered by a reckless border wall. Many animals face extinction just as we coal mine canaries do. Watching from higher ground, wondering, how can we heal? Erosion, scars, climate change, and its firestorms, floods, <clears throat> pollutions that mirror like a bad parable, the destruction of America's ideals and freedoms. Uprising. This is the happy ending. <clears throat> Share a glimpse with me into paved over earth what thrives invisible below the concrete, where tree roots whisper saving knowledge to each other, where mother trees nurture their seedlings, signal warnings to the kin, sing forest spirits back into the sacred circle. Listen closely, they are mobilizing to sue for damages and take back the land. Uh, this poem is for the water protectors of Standing Rock and the generation of the seventh fire. The seventh fire is part of the Anishinaabe prophecy. They are the youth of today, actually, some of them are now millennials of today, but uh, the seventh fire is the hope of the Anishinaabe people for a revival. Well water makes good pie crust, the well. I smelled a pie baking in the oven, oh man, I was stuck inside of memories wanting to see grandma again in her apron at the kitchen table, the kitchen sink, washing white flour dust off her hands under the tap, cold well water, tasting of iron and minerals, the pure water of the old ones that must be protected. The garden. Grandma was born in a time foretold in the seven fires prophecy of the Anishinaabe the era of the sixth fire, when elder mothers lost the respect of rebellious daughters, like my grandma and her mother. The legend of great grandma's herb garden passed into forgetfulness. We must see her story retold. I come back to you, Marie Oga de Basagi, renowned midwife, preserver of herbal wisdom. Can we revive good medicine? Now the children of the seventh fire have come. The oil patch. Disregarding sacred earth and its needs, oil barons only see profits in Alberta's tar sands. They strip the forests, divert rivers, drain wetlands to reach the oil. Ponds of toxic waste leak into the Ogallala aquifer. Failing regulations are leaky too. We fight against oversights, but no just delay comes our way. 
The extraction plan expands like the cancer that spreads among the Athabascan people. Elk and caribou herds die out. The pure well water and grandma's pies lose their natural sweetness. It's the last shake of the dinosaur's tail before we take the gasosaurus down. So where I live in Concord on the north side of Mount Diablo, the land once belonged to a group of Coast Miwok called the Chukkan. Ohlone's were neighbors on the south side of the mountain, and the Chukkan lived on the north side. This is a modern Indian, but he knows his history, and he's going to tell it to you straight. Modern Miwok man. Jackrabbit sprints up the hill following a track in the grass. He who found rabbit's trail, modern Miwok man, thought it was a deer path. Hunts with a rifle now, follows a jog in his memory guided by rabbit. Stories lodged in the collective unconscious of a village on Cerro Alto de los Obones high hill of the Volvon tribe. His Chukkan ancestors would visit before the days marked by European time, 1775, when Captain Juan de Ayala sailed in through Boca del Puerto de San Francisco, which Fremont later named the Golden Gate, Chrysopoli. Even before there was gold, and a quest for holy dust that drove men mad. Unaware that a city of harvest gatherers and hunters dwelt in the hills as they'd lived for millennia, preparing food from over 700 bedrock mortars, grinding the acorn harvest. They too unaware that new names were given to the sacred places of their land in a language imported from Spain, improper words assigned by immigrant people who didn't know directions or even comprehend where they stood. In the remote mountain fastness, over 60 homes of the Volvon, Bay Miwok families, tilled meadows, planted bulbs of brodia and lily, tended groves of walnut, pruned riverbank willow, made journeys in the summer to the bay shore for salt, shellfish, relief from the heat sent their strongest warriors north across the dangerous Karkin Strait in Tule Reed Sakas, canoes, then took footpath to the Clear Lake tribes to trade and barter and seek permission to mine obsidian for blades, axes, arrowheads. Modern me man speaks. We followed the rhythm of time as we knew it, says modern Miwok man. But time is a thief. The Volvon Bay Miwok city long deserted. Spanish Franciscan friars and their soldados took us away. We escaped. Troops followed us back, cursed our religion, reviled our medicine men, renamed sacred mountain Ojampele after K. Cabran el Diablo abducted us to missions where we learn new ways to survive, to play new kinds of music, notes scratched on a page, new rituals from a book they said was holy. We raised cattle for the Spaniard and the gringo. The smallpox took most of us. Modern Miwok man now follows the call of his work, a steward of the environment, a biologist, using knowledge of his tribe's traditional ecology to restore streams, native plants, and scientific methods to reverse the pollutions of Earth Mother. History says we lived under six flags in this state of California, an amusement park joke, many more than that, but no flag raised to honor our Bay Miwok Volvon people, once a nation, 
still here to protect the land and water. Speaking of water, <clears throat> I was very happy to have a poem accepted into your magazine, the Santa Clara Review. I'll read that one now. Be a warrior on the spirit plane. Be like the fish that throws itself upstream, like trout seek their source against the current. Like the salmon that climbs a rock ladder, so too does the spirit fight for you from within. Be like the stone that hurls from a sling or the arrow that slices the trepidant air. Be like the blade that cuts through to a clearing. Understand the aspirational purpose of getting there. And so, like the swift steed, give yourself to the rider and be like your master. Never flinch from the fire. I'll end with a bit of prayer meditation here. The call of a red-tailed hawk enters my meditation. Flutter of wings as it leaves its perch in a nearby oak. Flies uphill. Calls out several times. Then stillness returns. I am moving from a place of weakness and struggle, strength flowing into me. I've learned about the power of wounds. I understand the law of my being, integrating ego with spirit guidance, learning love, to have no more fear, I leave nothing out. I don't try to climb out of my family skin. Not anymore. I find new wiggle room in the old. Hawks settle down somewhere, quietly perusing his realm from a branch overlooking blue oak forest and meadow. In the woods, silence reigns. Joy arrives. Peace for a time. Thank you. I just realized I forgot to read my poem from you. So, is that okay? <laughs> yeah, I know. That was my ending, yeah. <laughs> you know, as musicians, we look for the perfect ending. Sorry, Lucy. And now, oh, that it was really fantastic, Dave. No problem about the 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 uh, not reading the poem from the anthology. You're welcome to buy an anthology and read it. <laughs> okay, and now we really will have Allison Hart. Uh, Allison identifies as a mixed race, Black, Irish, Scottish, English, and Passamaquoddy Native American woman of color. Award-winning and best-selling author Isabel Allende praised Allison's novel, Mostly White, as so compelling it gave me goosebumps. 
And uh, I have to say, I read that book and it gave me goosebumps too. Um, Allison is also the author of a poetry collection called Temp Words from Cosmo Press. And her play, Mother Daughter Dance, was produced by a black box theater in San Francisco. She is passionate about creating work that informs the reader about American history from the perspectives of marginalized and often forgotten voices. She is a writer, musician, mother, and music teacher. Welcome, Allison. Waliwan, Kichini West, Skijinawuk, all my relations, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you, Santa Clara University. Thank you, Lucille. Thank you so much. These poets have been incredible and inspiring. I'm so thankful to read amongst all of you. Okay, so I'm gonna start by sharing a photo of my brother. And um, because the poem that I'm going to read is called Apparition, and it's about him. And he passed, here's my, oh, I'm on YouTube. <laughs> I can see it right now. So he passed um, in 1996. He was 29 years old. He did not have health insurance. Um, he was going to the ER room for health care, and they misdiagnosed him and just sent him off without a blood test. Three times he went, and he was given an inhaler. 21 days later, he died in an ICU in San Francisco with complications from leukemia. So this is from my brother. It actually is the anniversary. The 25th year anniversary is coming up in November. So I'm honoring my brother, who I always love, in spirit, forever, for you. So the poem is called Apparition. It's in Red Indian Road West, which again, I'm really happy to be in this anthology. Okay. Walking to my brother's grave, past farmhouses, snowy fields, I step into spirit land. Are they resting? I look for the bench. We love you, mommy, not Scott's. Recognize the open fields when we sprinkled his ashes into a square hole in the earth, trying to joke, saying he'd rather like a circle. Placing my hair, I cut for him, the last of him, dust. Back to the earth with all those moaning spirits. I find the bench, tears fall as I dig up the snow, revealing damp earth and find his name. 1967 to 1996, so definite, so factual. His life, his death, entombed under a tree. I light the sage on the cement plaque, praying to great spirit, to the ancestors. I don't ask for anything, but the wind to take my smoke prayers and peace for him and for him to know I love him wherever he is. Kneeling in the snow, sage smoke rising, faint wind blows. I empty my thoughts. Peace swirls around me. I break off a twig of berries and place it on his plaque. Kiss my finger, place it on his name. I know he isn't there. That he has become the sky itself, smiling down on me. I was grieving my brother and I was working as a temp in San Francisco on Market Street. And the only thing that would keep me together is walking down to Embarcadero Pier and just looking out over the bay. So this poem is called Embarcadero Pier. Near the crab man, listening for Scott, not having any money, listening, wind in a dress, feel old, like a wise woman with wrinkled hands and soft eyes, feather in the sky, spirit flying. 
So now I'm gonna change it up and I'm gonna read from my novel, Mostly White. And I did not know my family history. I was not told any history in school. And so I had to create a narrative. And this book, Mostly White, is my narrative. The narrative my mom could not write because she just survived her childhood. That's what she did. She did that brilliantly. And we always said, Mom, why, why don't you write a, a, a book? And it was that just wasn't what she did. She was a writer and a poet and a scholar, but she didn't write about her family history. She survived it, and I'm grateful to her. So Mostly White is a family saga based on my mixed race heritage, Black, uh, Native American, Pasmaquoddy, and Irish in Maine. And you're probably aware of the history now of residential schools in this country and Canada as well that's come out. When I was researching for the book, I came across the history and it just devastated me. And at the same time, it, I just felt so compelled to bring it out in my narrative. So I'm gonna hold up a picture, where is it? Did I bring it? Oh yeah, I did. <laughs> a picture of my great grandmother, Emma. Now Emma is seen holding, she's got an American flag wrapped around her and she was black and Pasmaquoddy Native American. And I'm gonna start with her. So I based a character on her and she starts out the book. And it's Washington County, Maine in 1890 and 1879. That's when the school, that's when the Bureau of Indian Affairs, they established a law forcing Indian children into residential schools. So it's 1890 in Washington County, Maine. This is from my novel, Mostly White. The chapter is called Snake. It, this is Anna speaking. They beat me. I tell you, that's what they did. They did at that school. Mm, they beat me. School. Hmm. If I spoke my language, mm, those nuns would get so mad and call it the devil's language. And Sister Anna, she'd get out the switch. Everyone in the eyes, everyone's eyes in the class widened, turned to me. I didn't care. I was tough. Mm. I was too tough for them, already 11. They beat me and I didn't cry. Tried to beat the Indian out of me. Only good Indian is a dead Indian. Kill the savage, kill the savage, save the man. Take me to the front of the class and with that switch, smack, smack, smack until I bled. They couldn't get to me. I made myself real small, so small, no one could get to me. It wasn't me they were beating, they couldn't get to me. That's what any, of, any one of you will get if you speak the devil's language in here. Sister Anne props the switch by her desk, silence in room. I'm a lump on the floor. My brother, he is the only one that can see me that small pebble I've become. Joe wipes his eyes. Joe, don't cry, silly Joe. You know, she didn't get to me. No, you know that little Joe, little Joe. My head is face down. I can see the crack in the floorboards. It smells like dust, cold dust. Get up, you little nigger savage. She sounds like a snake, hissing. Savage, I said get up. I get up hissing, she is a snake. I stamp my foot bent low. They know, the class knows, they want to join the dance like we did back home. They shift in their chairs. I move around the room. Sister Ann shouts, you come here, you little savage. I swerve past her in between desks. I head towards the door, the open door. Why aren't the children holding my hands so we can coil, coil up like a snake? I smell sage, a rattle shakes. I go towards the door. You come here right now. She gets out the switch, stomps towards me. I turn towards the door. The children bang the, 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 on the desk, the beat, beat of the drum, the beat. Sister Ann catches me, grips my arm. Loud footsteps. Sister Dorothy comes. What is going on? 
Quick, get her, she's speaking the devil's language. Devil's language, is she? Sister Dorothy clenches my arm, I'm bent down, foot stamping. The children banging the desks, pulse of the drum. Thank you for your attention, your kind attention and listening. I'm gonna end with a poem from Temp Words and I'm gonna dedicate this to my son. I wrote it when I think he may have been about eight and he's now like 21, like many of you in college, a junior. And this is my global warming poem. It's not funny, but okay. It's called Enough Earth. Is there enough earth to hold all our dreams or is time running out as glaciers melt and carbon rises? Is there enough earth to hold all of our dreams or our slides, quakes, tsunamis, fires, triggering, flight, fright, freeze, lower brain stems, activate, ready to run? Is there enough earth? for all our dreams, or did this generation use it up, feeding banks while children's mouths hang open? Is there enough earth to hold all our dreams, or do they only exist at night, causing no waste, no heavy steps, no need to worry about tomorrow, or the next 10 years when climate change is irreversible? Is there enough earth to hold all our dreams, if I could, I would hold yours in my hand, little one, tell you not to worry, go run, go play. I'm holding it, holding it for you. So thank you so much. And Wuli Pamusan, walk in a good way. Wali one, thank you. Wow, that was that was amazing. Very powerful. I just I can't believe how you imagined into the lives of your ancestors in that book. Really great stuff. And painful too. So um, again, kuda pudish to everyone for being here. Kuda pudish for all of the poets for your, your great work and kuda pudish. To, um, to Kirk and Santa Clara University for, for sponsoring this event. Um, and we would be happy to answer questions now if, if anyone in the audience has questions for any of us. No, maybe we're, re we're ready to wrap it up. If we have any, well, we have we have some thanks on on YouTube, but no questions there either. Yeah. Um, no, I was just checking. There were some thank yous, so it was working. That's good. Um, <laughs> um, well, I guess I'd i just be curious about you know you mentioned um, coming up with the name for the Red Indian Road West anthology, and I was just wondering if you might say a few words about about how you did that, what that was all about. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, the coming up with that title was a, a collaboration. Um, we felt like we had to have California in the title. Um, so that became the subtitle, Native American Poetry from California. And uh, Kurt was working off the, um, the uh, idea of the road to California that, was my, that, that came from my dream. And he, he, came, he first thought of the po a possible title, 
Red Indian Road, California. Um, but then in talking about it more, um, we decided to make it Red Indian Road West and, and put California in the, the subtitle. Yes. Um, I have a question. We were discussing in class today, and there are a couple of students here, about uh, brokenness. So I was wondering, and this is a question for Timothy Floyd, how do you prepare to write about brokenness? And how do you, and survival, and how do you write about brokenness, survival, and then even healing? That's a really, it's a good question, and it's a big question, and I think Allison is going to be able to address it, because she really addressed brokenness in a big way in her novel. So, thank you for your question, and the way I see it is that, you know, my ancestors lived through it, I can write about it. And sometimes it does get hard. Um, researching and and feeling what my family had gone through or my my ancestors um, and I guess what saves me is a sense of my own spirituality and I incorporate that into my novels so there's always a sense of a other world supernatural and in the case of mostly white it's it's Native American um, mythology, spirituality, um, and also nature. The power of nature is ever present, especially water in the novel. So that's what carry. it's bigger than one person's pain. That's the way I would answer that question. Thank you. Um, I think it's important to know about the prophecies. Um, the Anishinaabe have a very strong tradition of the seven fires. And they even talk about an eighth fire. The eighth fire is sort of the coming world. And in that world, we're walking the road together, a healed people. So I think we need to look at our time as something that will pass. I think we're going to go through it. It's going to hurt like hell. <laughs> um, but that I think our holy men and our prophets have told us we have a destiny to be a unified humanity. Uh, Black Elk of the Lakota spoke of this too. He too said that one day we will all be under the flowering tree together as a unified tribe. And I, I think part of my own way of addressing the brokenness um, was to create these two anthologies. Um, yes, you know, um, Native Americans have really endured a lot and suffered a lot, but, but we're still here. And this anthology is a testament to that. Um, and there's, there's, much, uh, there's much joy and celebration and dancing in the book as you know as well as as sorrow and loss and the same with with fire and rain eco poetry of california i mean we have broken ecosystems in california and worldwide there's a lot of environmental devastation um we're the you know we're experiencing tremendous amounts of habitat loss and loss of species um and climate change uh, causing horrendous fires and floods worldwide. So all these terrible things are going on, but the world is still a beautiful place and California is still a beautiful place. And this book, in, in addition to documenting really sad things um, like clear cutting so much of the, of the redwoods and 
um, extinction of species. The book also is a is a a celebration of the the beauty and the survival of California ecosystems. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. I'm, I'm noting the time and um, want to leave a little time to be able to buy some of these books back there as well. So thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, poets, for your beautiful words and spirits. And um, may all go well. <laughs>